Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about Calvin's theology. In the last couple of lecture videos we've talked about his rise to influence and authority in Geneva. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what he taught uh, about the practice of Christianity and about the relationship between God and human beings. Calvin, like Luther, taught that human beings were radically depraved by original sin like the rest of creation. He taught that humans can come to a knowledge of God despite their radically depraved natures through the scriptures and through themselves, but that any appeal to the created world was a type of blasphemy. And so this is again linked to this philosophy of nominalism. Does the created world, does human reason, does that or can that be used to direct human beings towards God, or is that presumptuous and blasphemous? And Calvin taught that the only way we can have certainty about God, which remember that's very important for Calvin, that's what draws him to the study of the law early in his, uh, early in his life, early in his career, the only way that we can find this certainty about God is in the scriptures. Anything else is supposition and is dangerous speculation. Now, because of this, he also rejected music, art, and statues, uh, just like Zwingli had. Um, these things are a distraction to the soul. The soul should be focused on uh, reading the scriptures. Uh, any sort of uh, artwork and beauty, uh, physical art and beauty, that's a dangerous distraction. And you can see this a little bit when you look at Calvin's church in Geneva, that it, it has still the medieval stained glass windows, but everything else has been stripped uh, as bare as possible. And this was designed to concentrate uh, the mind of the believer solely on the word of God. As you might imagine, Calvin rejects papal authority in favor of the authority of a community of believers. He thought that the sacraments are powerful signs of reality, but are not the reality. Um, Sometimes he taught the sacraments can be so powerful, such powerful signs, that they do have some sort of spiritual effect. But that is not to say that the one can be saved, one soul can be saved through the sacraments. So the sacraments are not the reality. Baptism is a sign of the forgiveness of original sins, but is not the forgiveness itself. The Eucharist uh, is uh, neither the changing of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, nor the addition of the body and blood of Christ to the bread and wine, as Luther had taught, consubstantiation, transubstantiation is the Catholic teaching that I gave first. He taught that it's neither of these things, it's simply a symbol of unity, Christian unity that commemorates uh, the Lord's Supper. have to talk about most importantly this is the always the aspect of Cowan's teaching that uh, draws most people to uh, most raises people's interest in reading about Calvin is the teaching of predestination so Jerome Bolsek was a refugee from France like so many others were in Geneva at that time who attacked Calvin's doctrine of predestination uh, he had been part of a religious order and married, and but then left that order as an act of rebellion against the Catholic Church. He settled in Geneva as a physician, and he referred to scriptural passages to suggest that God wanted all human beings to be saved. And uh, this ran contrary to Calvin's teachings. And it forced Calvin to define his teaching on predestination in more detail. And so Calvin's teachings are very much the logical conclusion of Luther's teachings about sola gratia. Calvin uh, taught, or rather Luther taught, the doctrine of single predestination. That God knows which people are going to end up in heaven. And that's already been established. Calvin took that to the obvious um, extreme by saying if God knows the people who are saved, if God knows the people who are going to heaven, God also knows the people who are going to hell. And so uh, he taught double predestination. God knows both those who are going to heaven and those who are going to hell. He claimed that Catholic uh, arguments for free will uh, reject human depravity. We know that humans are depraved and sinful. They sin all the time. It doesn't matter what environment you put them in. Uh, the idea that Catholics are choosing 
uh, through their own actions, whether to go to heaven or whether to go to hell, uh, that was something that Calvin rejected. And so Calvin taught that all are not created equal, but some are predestined to one life and some to another. And that before the creation of the world, God decided who he wanted to save, and their salvation was determined regardless of how they acted on earth but that there were some people who God wanted to send to hell. And therefore, uh, that from the beginning of time, he had hardened their hearts against believing in the gospel, and uh, this meant that they would go to hell. So those who were saved were saved forever. Those who were damned were damned forever. This totally changes the way you live life as a Christian. And the goal, and let's say you're a Christian political leader, the goal of life is not to save souls because whether they're saved or not has already been decided. The goal is to glorify God. And so this blends into, or this encourages and supports this very totalitarian theocratic state that we've been seeing with the city of Geneva. The idea is to remove those whose lives are not glorifying God through imprisonment, through exile, and to create uh, a society of the godly. Now, this teaching sounds pretty crazy to most people. What's the point of being Christian then if you know uh, one way or the other whether you're saved? And uh, Calvin taught that those who were saved, uh, their behavior would indicate whether or not they were saved. But it's important to set the context in which Calvin developed this teaching of predestination. It's partly developed as a response to the Catholic response to the rise of Protestantism in France. Now think about uh, the life of any Christian in Europe in the years from basically 400 to 1500. Uh, it was based around the Catholic sacraments. You needed to confess your sins and receive absolution. You needed to receive the Eucharist to uh, be spiritual food for your soul. Uh, most importantly, before you died, you needed to receive the sacraments of the church. And so now we get into the Reformation. There are Protestants in France who are not following these rituals, not observing these rituals for the first time in over a thousand years for some of these families. And some of them feel very concerned that in not following these rituals, some of them think, can't we just go along with what Calvin's saying, uh, but also do the sacraments as well to make sure we got our bases covered. And Calvin says, what Calvin is saying in promoting the doctrine of predestination predestination in this way, is he saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that let's say your local Catholic priest has excommunicated you from the sacraments uh, because of the Reformation. You shouldn't want these sacraments. The sacraments don't change whether or not you're saved. Whether or not you're saved has already been determined by God. So this is a, a fairly um, explosive doctrine. Uh, however you cut it, but it's important to understand the context in which uh, Calvin was explaining this. Uh, as I explained before, this supports the rise of a theocratic Protestant state in which, uh, to use Calvin's quote, statecraft is soulcraft. Uh, this is a state that's much uh, where you have a theocratic society where the state and the religion are one and are governing of soul as well as the body of uh, the inhabitant, inhabitant or citizen. Calvin's success in Geneva provided him with a basis for him to spread his reforms, but he faced other challenges. Michael Cervatus was a Spanish Protestant who also challenged Calvin's authority. Um, Servetus had the distinction of being a Protestant who was condemned by both Protestants and Catholics. He rejected the Trinity, he called himself an angel, and because uh, he was promoting these heretical beliefs, he was expelled from Spain and uh, went to Paris. And there he takes up an anonymous debate with Calvin in print. So they're each publishing articles, uh, debating and responding uh, to the other. Now, Calvin worked out who it was, and he tipped the Inquisition off. This is Michael Cervatus. He's in Paris now. Uh, you should go get him. And so uh, Cervatus is forced to flee. And, but for some reason, he feels drawn to Geneva. And Calvin had already said that if Cervatus ever came to Geneva, he would not leave alive. 
Uh, but Servetus unwisely comes to Geneva and uh, on Sunday he has to go to Calvin's church because everyone in the city is going and attending this church. He's recognized, uh, imprisoned and uh, executed. And Calvin had wanted to uh, commute the sentence to the beheading. William Farrell said, don't be weak. This is a heretic who needs to be executed. Uh, and he was burned to death. Uh, Calvin may not have been in favor of the burning, but he was totally in favor of the execution. Uh, execution and banishment of the wicked and who were condemned to hell. This was seen as a way of glorifying God according to Calvin's theology. Some people have argued that this was an effort having Sabatus debate Calvin was an effort to embarrass him. Uh, they hoped that Sabatus could defeat Calvin in debate at trial. Uh, if it was a test of Calvin's authority, Calvin passed with flying colors. And his authority in Geneva was now totally secure and the consistory became extremely powerful. Summoned uh, between six and seven percent of the population every year uh, to be uh, reprimanded or corrected. Uh, the meetings would last for hours. It worked with the little council, which still held executive power in Geneva. Anyone who resisted the consistory could be turned over to the little council and could be punished in this way. Calvin remained a prolific preacher. He recognized that this was how he had come to his authority. He recognized that this was a part of maintaining his authority. Uh, so he still preached three times a week at five uh, in the evening and three times on Sundays, as well as giving lectures on Fridays. He continued to publish uh, pamphlets and develop commentaries on the entirety of the Bible. Now, Calvin's success would enable him to expand his influence beyond Geneva. And this is the real importance of Calvin's legacy. Uh, like Luther, he made use of the printing press to spread his ideas. He recognized the importance of establishing a printing industry in the city of Geneva. So Geneva becomes one of the chief printing cities in Europe as a result of Calvin's presence there. So uh, from Geneva, from this place where the Protestants are safe, they're able to print uh, pamphlets, and documents about Protestant theology and promoting Protestant theology in different languages and to send them out to the different um, send them out to different parts of Europe to encourage more people to convert to uh, Protestantism. He also founded a university in Geneva to uh, educate Protestant missionaries. Now, this university was led by a man named Theodore Besa, who was a former priest from France had extensive training in Greek and in other humanistic doctrines. So here we see an extension of the Renaissance again. Uh, the Renaissance program applied to the Reformation and Basa would become Calvin's successor. So you have lots of people who are fleeing from uh, Catholic lands in Europe, in France and in England and in Scotland. Uh, and they're coming to Geneva to seek refuge. They come to Geneva and then they will uh, receive training there. They will go back to these lands to preach Protestant Calvinist uh, theology. And these missionaries are active in England, in Switzerland, in France, in Scotland, in Poland, in Bohemia. And uh, the university produces anywhere up to 30 missionaries a year. Geneva remains an international headquarters. It remains a place where uh, disputes and debates about uh, Calvinist theology could be sent, starts to sound quite like uh, the Vatican and the papacy, just with uh, different theologies. Uh, but this uh, network means that Protestantism is going to spread throughout Europe, and it gives Calvin the title of Father of International Protestantism. Calvin dies in 1564, by the time uh, by this time, Protestantism is firmly established in uh, Europe. And uh, Calvin has provided the movement with a unified uh, theology um, and uh, unified teachings. Uh, suffered from illnesses towards the end of his life, remained uncertain of God's mercy, and requested to be buried in an unmarked grave that you can see here. But his legacy would live on uh, throughout uh, the rest of the history of Christianity.